I do like to run a fairly tight ship, so I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm Reverend Bob Moore. I'm executive director of the Coalition for Peace Action, and on behalf of the coalition and our 36 co-sponsors, I'd like to welcome you to this 41st annual Conference for Peace. Uh, this is the first one that we are doing electronically by Zoom. They've all been in person prior to this one. And so we're hoping that it goes smoothly. We've done everything we can to try to lay the groundwork for that. Um, I also want to take just a moment to give a special thanks to our co-sponsors. And Nikki, could you put that on the share screen for a moment? 36 co-sponsors. Uh, and we're very pleased uh, with each and every one of you and want to thank you uh, very much. So just take a, a glance at that uh, co-sponsor list there. And uh, Nikki, if you could take the share screen down, I'd like to just take a minute. And some of you don't have your picture showing, which is fine. But if you are representing a co-sponsor, I'd like you to let your picture show and raise your hand. Raise your hand if you are representing one of the co- Oh, Mary and Dorothy, there's. Yeah, Carol Watchler from Bayard Rustin Center. Uh, so I know there's other co-sponsors. Oh, here's Jack Johnson from the United Methodist Church, Reverend Jack Johnson, Carol Johnson, uh, Susan Nowelski. Thanks to all of, oh, Karen Hernandez Granson, Reverend Karen. So there's a great, uh, many of these 36 are represented by somebody uh, today. <coughs> so I wanna thank all of the co-sponsors as we launch into our first speaker. I also wanna say just one uh, groundskeeping uh, rule, which is that we will have a question and answer period after each of our speakers. If you have a question to ask, you can post that in the chat box. And Rob Kraft, our seminarian from Princeton Seminary, uh, will help me uh, sort through those and I'll be the one presenting those questions on your behalf where we can. We'll be having uh, questions grouped together if we have too many questions to get through. Um, so again, uh, with all of that, thanks, welcome, thanks especially to our co-sponsors, but thanks to all of you for being on this uh, 41st Annual Conference for Peace. And to introduce our first speaker, I'm going to call on Richard Moody, a former fighter pilot who is now a very active peacemaker and has been a great asset to our peacemaking work in the Coalition for Peace Action. Richard. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, as a fellow veteran, albeit a slightly older one, it gives me great pleasure indeed to introduce retired Major Danny Shawson. Danny is the director of the Eisenhower Media Network. He entered West Point in July of 2001, two months before the September 11 attacks, and served as a US Army officer from 2005 to 2019 with combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is contributing editor at antiwar.com, a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, The Nation, The Huffington Post, The Hill, Salon, The American Conservative, Mother <laughs> Jones, Cheer Post, and Tom Dispatch, among other publications. He taught American and civil rights history at West Point and is the author of two books, Ghost Riders of Baghdad, Soldiers, Civilians, and the Myth of the Surge, a memoir and a critical analysis of the Iraq war, and Patriotic Descent, America in the Age of Endless War. He has a BA in history from the US Military Academy at West Point and an MA in American and military history from the University of Kansas. In 2019, he was awarded the Lannan Cultural Freedom Fellowship, and he also co-hosts the podcast, Fortress on a Hill, along with fellow vet, Chris Henry Henriksen. Please welcome Danny. Well, thank you so much for 
having me. I was incredibly, as I always am, incredibly flattered and I don't know, almost surprised every time I find out someone even reads something I wrote, let alone wants me to speak. Uh, I hope I kind of hold on to that forever, but it's, uh, it's always a surprise that someone cares what my insufferable ranting has to say. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that this title, right, the title of this organization, the title of this, uh, this event is a radical act these days. It is a radical act indeed to say the word peace. I mean, no one talks about that anymore. To call for peace, to expect that a country should be at peace more than it's at war. Uh, yesterday when I was uh, walking into a place to get lunch and watch uh, a little bit of football while I finished a column that was past deadline, uh, a teenage hostess uh, told me she liked the stickers on my car, which is essentially a you know, a driving progressive billboard. And in that process, uh, she said, you know, in my class, we were talking about the Iraq war, you know, right after 9-11, the early 2000s. And she was saying how she didn't even really understand how it happened, like what we were doing. And I said, well, how old are you? I didn't really know. And she said, well, I'm 18. And I said, well, you know, you're the first 18 year old in American history, your generation is, to have born, be born into a war that is essentially ongoing. I mean, unless you count, obviously, our native genocide. Uh, but this is a remarkable thing. Uh, we just had Veterans Day passed, uh, which meant I had a busy week, right? When you're uh, one of the relative token, outspoken, you know, public anti-war vets, uh, you find yourself in a lot of events, uh, a lot of radio calls and all of this. Um, I find it a little exhausting. Uh, first of all, I think when we talk about this word peace, this radical act of peace, we have to keep in mind that, you know, Veterans Day is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, it's been relabeled Veterans Day, but I often like to go back to Armistice Day, which, of course, is the, uh, the real genesis of our Veterans Day. The moment, you know, at the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, when the guns fell silent on the Western Front. At least nine million soldiers were dead in the most mechanistic killing, certainly, in world history at that point. And the reason I think that we lost something when we moved away from Armistice Day and went to Veterans Day is that we lost the aspiration and also the cautionary tale that was inherent in Armistice Day. See, the idea was that never again Never again would the young men at the time, mostly, right, would the young men of Europe or the world or the United States be duped, right? Never again would they allow themselves to be drawn into this kind of killing for essentially no good reason. Uh, in that process, uh, we lost something. See, the Second World War begins and we say, well, obviously the war to end all wars didn't really work. In fact, it may have held the seeds of the next war. And so we renamed it Veterans Day. And that seemed like a rather, you know, nebulous choice. But actually, I think what happened is uh, when you celebrate Veterans Day, you lose the aspiration to create no more veterans, to stop creating combat veterans. No one ever talks about that anymore. The, the understanding is that we, what we actually do is we take this cult-like culture of military adulation, which is beginning to border on fetishization, and we take it to its logical conclusion of today where we assume there will always be combat veterans as though it has always been thus and always should be. You know, there were two things on my mind uh, today for this talk. The first one coming out of Veterans Day, coming out of a Trump administration and into a uh, really a big question mark, right, on foreign policy and war and peace of an, a Biden administration. I was thinking about patriotism, which obviously I've written about a lot recently. Um, my, you know, my most recent book is Patriotic Descent, which makes pretty clear how I think we should frame it. Um, but I think we saw the notion of patriotism, more than that, Americanism, highly contested, I believe, 
uh, especially in the Trump years by both sides. And, and this has been happening for, for quite some time. So I was thinking about patriotism and I was thinking about how do we, how do we fire up an anti-war movement, an anti-war base? Well, maybe I shouldn't say base because the base is on this call, right? There have been people who've never gone underground, right? Who've never stopped. There's a lot of talk about how, oh, it's not, it's not the 1960s anymore, so therefore there's no anti-war movement, and isn't that a shame? And certainly the strength of it isn't what it was, but there have always been folks uh, who were in that game uh, when I was still carrying water for the empire and long before that, which is one of the reasons uh, I sort of reject this notion that you kind of hear out in the streets sometimes, or at least I do, of, you know, okay, boomer, right? And uh, I reject that for a lot of reasons, because uh, obviously so much groundwork had been laid by older generations, not just from the baby boomers, but going back to, say, my heroes like Eugene Debs during the First World War. So I'm wondering how we fire up a base and how we get them interested in foreign policy, understanding that wars come home to them uh, in a time of AI, drone warfare, and increasing abstraction, right? Increasing abstraction, which leads to some important questions about maintaining the fire of peace activism during these Biden years to come, which is an inherently, an inherently provocative thing and something I think we need to talk about. So, you know, first of all, the, uh, the, the book I wrote on patriotism, I never planned to write. It was essentially forced upon me, uh, and I'm glad it was, by uh, Truth Digs old senior editor Bob Shear, uh, who had asked me the question out in Brentwood, LA, which is as far out of your element as a kid from Midland Beach and Staten Island, you know, uh, could be. We're sitting there looking at this perfect view. People are literally riding by in horses, uh, and I thought LA was a city. I was so wrong about that. And uh, he said, is patriotism toxic? And so then, I was like, man, what a question. I wish I would have framed that. And so I started telling him, well, you know, I think there's three kinds of patriotism. And, uh, and I was telling him a story about how I ended up on the Jumbotron in Kansas City at a Royals game. And I did. It was sort of forced upon me. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. My, uh, my wife at the time, you know, it was a very nice thought. She had emailed them and got us free tickets. Being the thrifty New Englander that she is of Puritan stock, she got us these tickets. And suddenly I'm on the Jumbotron and there's you know, it, it, pictures of me in Afghanistan, I'm, I'm armed with an assault rifle, and the whole thing, I'm waving at the camera for too long, and my students found it on YouTube later, and it was a big favorite to make fun of me with, but uh, at the moment, I mean, I felt a little sick to my stomach, and not because I don't like being the center of attention, nobody would ever accuse me of that, but because it felt obscene, and I said to myself, this is a, this is pageantry patriotism, this is over the top, isn't it? I mean, I'm old enough to remember, just barely, right, 37 years old, just old enough to remember a time when really there were only three days on the calendar, when war movies played all day, when we put soldiers on the 50-yard line or at the equivalent of in sports and other public events. And it was Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and, you know, maybe Independence Day, right, maybe Fourth of July. I might be missing a couple, but it wasn't every Sunday. It wasn't 162 MLB games a year. Uh, and I feel like we have gone over the top. It, it raises questions about a republic or an ostensible one. Who do we honor? Who do we trust? I mean, frankly, we put uniformed killers above anybody else in most of our ceremony. That's how far the culture has gone. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that uh, we should reject soldiers and that I am a self-hating soldier. My best friends are soldiers. Uh, most of them don't agree with me about any of this. And I maintain those relationships and we love each other. But we should be very clear in our language and we shouldn't shy away from things just because it's polite. We put killers on the 50 yard line. Not teachers, not nurses, not social workers, not often. And I do think this is a symptom of a really a sick society, uh, especially when places like the NFL are paid by the Pentagon to do those flyovers right, to do many of these things. Now, that's pretty insidious, and I don't think a lot of Americans know it, and if they do know it, I don't think they give it a second thought. I wonder, though, what we're celebrating exactly. I mean, a country that hasn't won a war since 1945 
arguably hasn't really fought one that needed to be fought since 1945. Certainly not a U.S. military which through its interventions has helped make the world a more decent, kind, or, you know, quality place. So what is so exceptional and so celebration worthy about the United States? Is it that we have twice as many guns as Yemen, a real life Wild West that's the second highest gun owning country in the world? Is it that we don't provide insurance for our sick as a right? Is it that we have wealth gaps that are gilded age levels that we, you know, we it reject rationality for delusion as a matter of course, uh, that we're 27th in the world in transparency, just above Bhutan, but behind Uruguay. Uh, something feels wrong about this. It really, really does. And, uh, and I feel though sometimes that we raise these issues and it doesn't really stick, right? And I feel like I'm not the only person in this call who's felt that way, especially for some of you who've been in this movement way longer than I have. I mean, I'm a latecomer. I stayed in the military a grotesquely long amount of time after I knew what I was doing was wrong, which was November of 2006 in Iraq. Um, maybe it's my latent Irish Catholic guilt, uh, but I think I'm doing a degree of penance. But some of you have been on the right side of history all along. And I imagine there's probably the same feeling that I have sometimes in the middle of the night of, am I doing anything? Am I having any effect? all this scrawling and pontificating I do, what, what's it for? How do we fire up a base? And, uh, you know, I think that that's a pretty important question. You know, I said in my book that there are three types of patriotism, and I said that it tracks the experience that I've seen anecdotally, but pretty large sample size of, say, my fellow officers who are either in or out of the army. How do they respond? Right? How do they respond to the war? How do they respond to their experience? In many cases, I think it's very similar percentage-wise, vaguely, that I'm going to lay out, to civilians. I said about 40% of them are pageantry patriots. Patriots, You know, it's flag-waving, it's bumper stickers. They really like getting TGI Friday's meals bought for them at the airport on their way to an illegal war. Uh, who doesn't, right? I mean, I get it. Uh, and some of those veterans, they, they remain angry at, you know, Arabs, Muslims, brown folks, right? And so there's this pageantry patriotism that kind of grows out of that. Now, not every pageantry patriot's a racist. That's not what I'm saying. But it's this surface level stuff. I think that both for my friends who are veterans and or, or still in the military, as well as for most of uh, the civilians, uh, I said that vaguely 50% are what I call passive patriots. And this is the polite sort of New Yorker reading, full disclosure, I read the New Yorker, uh, the, the polite New Yorker reading crowd that says, uh, I'm against discrete wars. I didn't like Iraq, and I certainly didn't like Bush, although I've forgiven him now because Trump was worse. I'm anti-war, but am I really? Am I anti-Bush in anti-war clothing? Am I anti-Trump in anti-war clothing? Where will I fall when there is a polite emperor? Where will I fall when there's a president who's potentially abusing executive power overseas, but I like him? He sounds kind of nice when he talks. His wife's pretty wonderful. This is the, the passive patriotism where I believe there's not a lot of action. Maybe we talk about it in our college, but we certainly don't go in the streets with the young people. And I realize I'm being a little bit of a reverse curmudgeon here, but I think it's important. And then there's the 10% that I call the, the patriotic dissenters, right? The participatory patriots. But I think the important question is how do we reach the passive patriots? Like how do we reach that group? Now we need to reach everybody, but I think that should be our first target. And this brings me to what may sound like an odd transition, but technology and drone warfare and war as abstraction. I mean, the reality is I do not think, <laughs> Lord help us, I, I don't, I, I'm knocking on the wooden table that is really my son's video game area, but he lets me use for peace activism. Uh, I really don't think that we're going to see too soon, another Iraq style invasion and occupation. 150, 200,000 soldiers on the ground. That kind of high intensity, overt, you know, uh, interventionism and militarism, at least for a while, it's out of style, isn't it? It's not really, it's not really uh, acceptable on either side. I mean, even a lot of Trump supporters at this point were kind of against that. I mean, they were for whatever he said, right? So when he said he was against it, they were against it. Now, if he would have switched, that's an open question. Nevertheless, what we will see is the low intensity 
inertia that we've had now for, we're in our 20th year. Well, it involves forward expeditionary basing. It involves advising and assisting and special forces teams. All the folks that President Obama was assuring us constantly were not combat troops. Um, I've seen a lot of non-combat troops of that sort get killed in combat, but we'll table that for a moment. But what you also have is technology, drone warfare, uh, abstractions that still kill, still starve the abstraction of, say, economic sanctions, where money is wired and where it's not. Most of this is invisible. How do you get the majority or at least the sort of plurality of Americans to care about foreign policy? And how do you get them to care about it in a time where you have that kind of abstraction? Well, it's difficult and it requires a little bit of idealism that I don't think is naive. Uh, it is reframing patriotism as aspirational, as values-based rather than borders-based, right? Uh, it is an accident, as I tell my two sons, specifically my older son, my older son is 12 years old. His name is Alexander James Michael. He's named after Alexander Fuller, uh, Michael Balsley and James Smith. Um, Alex and uh, Michael were killed on January 25th, 2007 in a roadside bomb in East Baghdad by a Shia militia that we then allied with later uh, against ISIS and that we also sort of created through our invasion. James killed himself afterwards while he was on leave. Uh, his best friend was Alex. Uh, so that's my son. I, I tell my son all the time, where you're born is an accident. It's an accident, right? Whether you're born in Botswana or Baltimore, is uh, really an accident of history. And so I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that there's this inherent humanity across borders. And that's a really difficult thing. But when we talk about patriotism, it matters as well, because if the patriotism is based on, you know, values, living up to the best of our founders, right? The best of the people who came after those founders and kind of corrected in many cases, a lot of the blind spots. Uh, and, and But also rejecting this idea of like a linear progress and we're there, we've got it, right? Civil Rights Act, it's over, we won. Uh, I think there's too much of, of that. But I, I tell them all the time, I said, listen, I love you to death. You're my ride or die guy. Uh, your life has not a single ounce of inherent value more than the Yemeni children that the government starves in your name. Now that may sound a little heavy for a 12 year old, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we'll say I couch it a little more carefully than that. So getting people to understand that this abstraction of war affects them involves showing them budgets, showing them trade-offs, showing them how this boomerangs back home, not just in their pocketbook, but also through fear of terrorism, which is actually increased demonstrably by American overseas action. And, uh, you know, when you look at the use of, say, drone assassination, explaining that, you know, if empires come home, and they always do, historically and conceptually, so will drone warfare. I was asked by a uh, Catholic workers newspaper to write an article about drones. Uh, and it was uh, the very end of May that they asked me to write it. And I had kind of a short notice turnaround to do it. And uh, as always, I had, you know, the news on in the background with no sound. I can't listen to their voices any longer, but I like to see what's happening. And I'm typing an article about how drone warfare could potentially come home. I mean, you can't make this up how it's gonna be used by police force, it's gonna be used by the government, we're gonna see this massive surveillance apparatus and wait until the other countries start using them. And we've set a precedent that you can surveil and kill in any country over any borders of a sovereign state without an ounce of permission in many cases. As I was typing it, I saw on the news that the burgeoning early protests in Minneapolis in the wake of George Floyd's death were being surveilled by, uh, by a customs and border protection drone. I couldn't believe it. It was the first time in 250, 300 articles I've written that I wrote something on the spot based on what was happening. I said, and as I, you know, as I watched this, which brings me to my last point, because I think it's important to do a full amount of time for questions, because I'm more interested in what you think than what I do and what's on your mind. The drone executor in chief until Donald Trump who escalated even further in many cases, was a rather amenable, polite, intelligent, 
man named Barack Obama, a Democrat, right? A liberal, a progressive who had opposed the Iraq war. These were all the ideas. Barack Obama not only increased drone assassination, setting new precedents, taking it to really obscene levels, he also executed an American citizen, an accused terrorist, probably actual terrorist, named Anwar al-Awlaki, also his teenage son. And then later, Donald Trump sent a raid, some Navy SEALs into Yemen, where this happened, where the Saudis are starving Yemeni children by hundreds of thousands uh, with our support. And his daughter, a very, a very young girl was, was killed. So three members of that family were killed. Uh, Ilaki was an American citizen. And a lot of people will say, well, did he go to Congress? Well, absolutely, of course not. He didn't, he didn't get any, did, but, did he go, but did he go to the courts? Did he go to a magistrate? Did he get some sort of, you know, did he get permission there? Did he follow? Well, no, he didn't do that. No, 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 none of that, no warrant. He had a memo written by his own Justice Department, people he appoints. Uh, a lot of people say also, well, this is a terrorist. This is a guy who was calling for attacks that were actually happening in the United States. And what I would say to that is an important point, which is the law, due process, legal protections, they either apply to the worst of our accused criminals and terrorists, or they apply to none of us. And so that raises me the subject of fear, doubt. I'm afraid, I don't think anyone on this call I don't think anyone in this conference, but I am afraid that we will see what I saw in 2009, what so many of us did, which is an Obama underground moment. This moment where, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead, whether it's Bush or Trump, someone that we find a little more urbane comes in. And so much of what had styled itself as a potentially anti-war or pro-peace movement actually kind of goes dormant, an Obama era dormancy. Um, I, I will never probably forgive fully uh, that administration or the Democratic Party or, again, this is not about Republicans, Democrats per se, it's, it's a bipartisan problem is my point. Uh, I was in two surges, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, both failed, both shouldn't have happened. And, uh, and both took the lives of people directly under my command, some of whom I loved, all of whom I cared about. Uh, the second time around, which was actually in many ways a more absurd surge. Uh, the president who sent me was the same president who I used to secretly on the weekends at Fort Knox, throw on a hoodie without asking permission and go into Southern Indiana across the Ohio River and canvas for Barack Obama. Um, and that was the same president who increased drone strikes. This isn't a question of lesser evil. This isn't a question of hammering only one side. I think what's important about it is are we going to maintain the fire that even the more progressive activists like Chomsky and Cornell West, who told us, you know, support Biden, but tell the truth about him in Cornell's case, or support uh, Biden, but then immediately be active at the grassroots level in the streets to hold him accountable, like Chomsky told us. Are we going to do that? Well, I think the first litmus test is this Biden transition team. We have to take a hard look at what is to come. Here's what we know. This is a team that's coming in on foreign policy that is dug in like ticks into the military industrial complex and its sub wings in the consulting and think tank industry, hawkish think tanks that are funded by the same industries that gave us a Raytheon plant as Secretary of Defense in the Trump administration. So that's what, uh, you know, Kirkus Reviews said that my, uh, my book was a... Uh, in, it said that in mordant and deft prose, it was a clarion call for a new kind of patriotism. And I thought to myself at the time that if mordant and deft prose was uh, on my, you know, epitaph of my, <laughs> of my tomb, that would be great. But that, that is something I think that we need to focus on. Uh, where veterans will fit in on that, uh, I have to defer, actually, to a rather controversial man, but to his uh, beautiful lines at the end of the movie Platoon, which I watched on Father's Day for the first time with my 12-year-old son I spoke of, named after those soldiers. And at the end of the movie, and he saw me tearing up again, uh, Chris Taylor, the Charlie Sheen character, is uh, doing a soliloquy in the helicopter as he leaves Vietnam after being wounded for the second time. And he says that those of us who did make it have an obligation to teach to others what we know. Uh, and to try with what's left of our lives to find a goodness and a meaning in this life, 
I do not think that veteran dissenters are going to lead this movement. I do not think that that is appropriate in a republic. But I do think that that's our duty. And I try, try to live those values. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Major Danny Sherson. I thought that had a lot of depth uh, to it. So thanks for laying such good groundwork. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to just interject before I start reading some of the questions that have been submitted, and again, thanks to Rob for helping me sort through them and more can still come. We have about close to 15 minutes, probably 12, 13 minutes here for Q&A before our next speaker is that the Peace Action Education Fund of the Coalition for Peace Action started uh, up an interfaith network on drone warfare. It's a national project. And uh, we've done uh, a national conference. We've done regional conferences. We've done some videos. So if you go to our website and just click on that icon on the right-hand side of peacecoalition.org, you can see all about the interfaith work on drone warfare. We've got a presentation coming up soon by Kathy Kelly, uh, who is a longtime peace activist based in Chicago, who has seen drone, drone warfare and the victims up close. So uh, that's going to be on December 2nd. So stay tuned. And we're working on this and have been working on it for six years or so now. So I just wanted to interject that. So I'm going to start with a um, uh, question, actually. My wife and daughter get first first credit here. What is the relationship between patriotism and membership in the global community? What does it mean to prioritize a country's interests? You know, that's the key question that Bob asked me. He said, is patriotism itself toxic? Um, and then Steve from Payday Books said, write it and write it fast. And uh, I sat on it for too long and therefore I had to procrastinate and write it quickly, probably showed. Uh, and I, for a long time, I said, I don't know if I can write a book about patriotic dissent because I don't think I like the word. I think maybe patriotism is toxic and obsolete. Uh, I still think that nationalism, right, is toxic, mostly purely. Um, that thing that I tell my son about not being more special than a Yemeni child or, you, you know, insert other... Uh, long-suffering child here, it remains relevant. I think that that's an important point. Uh, I know two things are existential threats, like in our face existential threats, uh, nuclear catastrophe and climate catastrophe. And uh, countries, nation states, self-interested by nature, shan't solve either of those. In fact, nation states are most likely to blunder into the first and are most likely to pursue self-interest on the second. So, you know, I'm a big believer in this citizen of the world type of mentality that's so often rejected as globalist or elite or naive, because I actually think it is rational to start talking about uh, global coalitions and, you know, cooperation uh, above the state, right, super state level, because it's the only thing that has the potential, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, to save the species, right? I mean, it's the only thing. It's the only way to, to, to make it so that I have grandchildren, which is not a certainty, right? So uh, I'm a big believer in that. Now, where patriotism fits in there, I think, is to the extent that we live in the world as it is, okay? Um, which, which, which I think we, we must, while always, you know, wishing for a better one and working towards a better one, you know, where we are now, meeting people where they are, I think we have to show them that you can love the country you were born in, right? Uh, but, but, but manifesting that through patriotism should be a values-laden act that ties itself to humanity everywhere. And so I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I think that we evolve past our current, you know, notions of patriotism and we build that coalition. So that, I think that's the best way I can, can put it. But borders and nationalism, I, I mean, I do ultimately reject a lot of the fetishization of both. Thanks for the question. It's really important. 
Yeah, thank you. I thought that was a very thoughtful answer. Our next question, how do we undo or defuse the weaponization of social media, especially Facebook and Twitter? How do we address the biases of the mainstream media? Well, uh, <laughs> I think we have to make a lot of personal decisions, okay, about where we, uh, where we get our news, uh, where we choose to send our money. Um, we have to expose and scream to the high heavens about the fact that uh, our media complex, uh, liberal and conservative, right? This doesn't matter, and both of those should be in quotes, uh, are funded, right? Or at least our uh, many members of that media are either funded, connected, or have a pecuniary and professional interest that is linked to the defense industry and the lobbying industry and the security consulting industry, and you name it. Right. It's, it's all very much one web. That sounds a lot like conspiracy theory until you realize, as I have in doing a lot of work and research on this, that if you want to prove that what I'm saying is demonstrably true, all the empirical data is unclassified. It's all public record. You can see the connections of all these people, generals, congressmen, media talking heads to uh, and corporate owners, right, of things like Amazon and Facebook and all these things. You could see the connections. You know, you, there's that game Seven Degrees to Seven Bacon to Kevin Bacon. You don't even need seven degrees to get to the military industrial complex. You show me a, a major establishment figure who's probably very wealthy, and I probably only need two or three degrees to get you to Raytheon. I mean, I would love to play that game sometime. We could do a whole separate conference, right? And I'll just do it off the top of my head. It's not that hard. Uh, so what to do about that is the hard part. You know, in many cases, I'm really good at identifying the problems and I'm not as great at uh, identifying solutions. But I do know that we need to make a lot of personal decisions in where we get our news. Uh, we need to make important decisions about uh, the kind of candidates we support or to the extent that we, you know, maybe not reject both, but decide to take the radical action of, when possible, street activism right this idea of the the radical act of the body and uh non-violently being willing to to sacrifice and make a statement even in a dangerous time when there's a lot of paramilitaries out there i've seen them when i was in tulsa and had guns pointed from you know proud boys it's a dangerous thing and to each according to his ability right i know i sound like i'm channeling marks there but it's a it's a good sentiment so i'm not expecting that everyone could do it but uh, I do think that every individual has an obligation to inform themselves about what's really going on, scream to the high heavens about these connections, um, and, and reject them, and then be willing to do something about it. That does not feel like a satisfactory answer, and I think a lot of people on this call probably heard it and can think of their own ways and add it to the group, and we should all be doing that. Thanks for the question. Now a question from uh, Richard who introduced you. How can we overcome the blackout of US military actions by the five, current five media conglomerates, including MSNBC, invested heavily in the armaments industry? Excuse me, that's actually from Charlene Leahy. I got mixed up, I think. Well, that's an important question because we do live in a moment where there were two candidates who were covered 24 seven by all the media stations uh, in an election that they told us decision 2020, right? Isn't that what the line was on MSNBC? And it was constant. I think, I think I'm looking at it right now. You know, it's like the election's over, but it's not right. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but we were told this is the most important thing that's happening. This election is everything. And it was an important election. I'm not saying that it wasn't what I do know though. It is two candidates who didn't even bother to broach did not even bother to broach in the debates, in most of their rhetoric, the fact that the United States is in the 20th year of a war um, that is fought pretty actively in, depending how you count, 15 to 25 countries. Uh, depending on your count, it's more than that, right? It could be up to 80. Uh, this, is, this is blacked out. We are in a tough situation where, you know, we only have so much control of how, you know, what can we do? I mean, we, we can't start, we all can't start our own media networks, but I think that we can do our best to highlight this uh, every day, demand from people at the very local 
the very localist level all the way up to Congress that they prioritize these issues. And, uh, you know, again, go to the respected alternative media that is covering this kind of stuff and, you know, be very skeptical. I mean, be very skeptical. My Twitter handle is skeptical vet, right? Full disclosure, but be very skeptical of the talking heads with stars on their uniforms, retired types, uh, who are also consultants and working for the military industrial complex. It is a radical act indeed to reject the uh, mainstream message and it does not make you a conspiracy theorist because again, the facts are out there. Again, this is a very difficult uh, question that I feel like, no, I, I don't think any one of us has the satisfactory answer to, but, uh, but caring and doing something small about it 15 minutes a day is a radical act. And I'll tell you, when hundreds of millions of people do it, then uh, flawed but sometimes beautiful Bobby Kennedy's ripples of hope starts to matter, as he mentioned in an old speech. Thank you. Now, another question. We've had a previous reputation for always winning that is now completely gone. I think this is the reason the public is no longer eager to get into a war. There is very little moral about this. It's just that we hate to lose and it hurts our global reputation. Do you agree? Well, definitely. But it's interesting how nobody pays any, there's no consequences, right? No responsibility and no accountability for not only the military leaders of these wars who can't totally be blamed, partly they can, can't totally be blamed because they were given impossible missions. Uh, and the civilian leaders who got them in, got us into them. And sometimes those, you know, there's a connection between the two. It's a very blurred distinction. You know, there's no responsibility, no accountability. So in other words, generals who lose wars win big in the boardroom after they retire. Uh, so it's kind of erased that we're losing, or at least that we're not winning. And one of the ways that we see this happen is no president, for example, no Congress person, no Senate Foreign Relations Committee head, wants to be the one who lost the war. And so what you'll do is you hand it off like a hot potato to the next administration. The idea being that, you know, there's an inertia that comes to this warfare. Uh, I think that that's a very dangerous thing in any organization, in any uh, entity, whether it be a state uh, or something else, when there's a lack of accountability, a lack of uh, responsibility taking, uh, you start to see a systemic failure. And, and that's my last point on this. I think that our critique, this is just my opinion, has to be systemic. It can't be an individual candidate, it can't be an individual war, you know, it can't be one issue. It has to be systemic. It has to be fighting against a warfare state that's tentacles are in everything from pharmaceuticals to the pageantry at your sports games to your bottom line in your pocketbook and the way the police will treat you in the streets if you protest. All of this is a cultural milieu, a cultural militarization that requires a degree of rejection. So, um, you know, holding folks accountable uh, and, and raising, you know, raising your ire, right? Raising your voice and doing something about it matters. And again, I understand how paltry that sounds, but I do think small things can be radical acts, especially in mass numbers. Thank you. And now the last question, and I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them, but I think this actually flows into your original framing of the three kinds of patriotism, Danny, so it may actually advance our thinking collectively. This person, Diane, writes, patriotism would be positive and not separate, separate us from one another if the culture and personality we are protecting is socially positive. We can be patriotic about our compassion and kindness, for example, or our desire to function as a citizen of the world. Patriotism associated with nationalism is divisive. I could not agree more. You know, uh, I, I use the word compassion and, and kindness. Uh, my poor son has to listen to a lot of, a lot of talk from dad, you know, and, uh, I tell them all the time, I say, I don't care what you are, I don't care what you become, and I don't care who you love, just be kind, right? Which sounds like a pretty low bar of advice from a father to a son, but actually it's an enormous act, right? To, to lead with kindness, for your reflex to tack towards kindness, compassion, empathy. Uh, we've seen a lack of that. And one way to reframe that patriotism, keeping it quite brief, is Everything that your government does is done in your name, regardless of whether there's a war tax or a draft. 
everything is done in your name. And, that, and that's not, that imperative form is not accusatory to anyone on this call, but it's something we all have to take accountability for. It's like a truth and reconciliation committee like we saw in South Africa, but collectively. I feel it every day. I talked about that penance feeling, right? Um, I think that when we take that kind of responsibility, we can reframe patriotism. Give me something to be proud about was my point earlier when I was talking about healthcare and all the bad things about this country. There are beautiful aspirations to it as well. And there have been moments when it has been a better form of itself and it's better angels and all of this. Give me something to be proud of and I'll be that kind of patriot. Until then, I believe that the only acceptable, the obligatory and the only decent response is in fact patriotic dissent. So I couldn't agree more. Thank you for the question and the statement that started the question. Thank you very much. All right, Danny, uh, let's give a round of applause. It'll be virtual, but let's show Danny how much we appreciate his excellent presentation and the answers he gave during q and A. I I thought there was a lot of depth and a lot of good stuff in there. Very stimulating. Now I'm going to, we're, we're on track to stay to our 90 minute uh, time frame, by the way, just in case you're wondering when is this all going to finish. We're trying to finish by about three. And to introduce our next speaker, I'm going to call on Nikki Van Aller, our assistant director. Thanks, Bob. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikki. I'm very happy to be introducing our next and our final speaker, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. She is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. And she's an adjunct professor for Georgetown, among other institutions. She served from 2009 to 2017 in the U.S. Department of State uh, as Special Envoy and Coordinator for Threat Reduction Programs. She was the Department of State lead for the 2010 to 2016 Nuclear Security Summits and represented the U.S. in the G7 Global Partnership against the spread of weapons and materials of mass destruction. She's also former Navy. I'm happy to turn it over to her now. Um, thanks again, Bonnie, for agreeing to speak for us. Great. Thank you, uh, Nikki, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, event. I look forward to uh, saying a few words and of, of course, looking forward to your questions. So I am going to be uh, talking about my area of interest and my area of specialization, which is what was a mass destruction, but mainly I'm gonna be focusing on nuclear weapons issues um, and looking at some of the questions that really are plaguing the arms control disarmament community uh, about the status of um, where the US is right now on these issues of weapons of mass destruction, focusing this discussion on the nuclear weapons issues. So I'm gonna share, um, share my, I have a few slides, hope you don't mind that I will be doing slides today. I wasn't going to, and then I figured I would just go ahead and do them. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind. Um, so um, as I said, um, as a result of actions that have been taken in the last three or four years in the area of nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. Um, the, the disarmament community has uh, really been wondering, you know, where is the U.S. right now on nonproliferation issues? Um, the U.S. has been a leader in the nuclear nonproliferation space, despite the fact that the U.S. has a has you know a lot of nuclear weapons, as as does uh, Russia. We have, in many other ways, been taking a lead in the nuclear nonproliferation regime which is the many uh, instruments that are used uh, to prevent nuclear proliferation. Um, but as a result of actions that have been taken, you know, we really have been wondering what is the US role? What will the US role be? Um, and what about the treaties that we are you know, withdrawing from any agreements that we are withdrawing from? So what I'm gonna do is just kind of go through a few of them so you can get a sense of why this question exists. Um, there's other things I could have talked about, but we only have a short time. So I'm going to just hit some of the highlights in terms of the this, in terms of the agreements that we are concerned with. So the first one is, is New Start, and that's the Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty, which many of you have probably been hearing about. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, this is a, a third in a series of treaties that are called Start. Um, this one, which was uh, concluded in 2011 and entered in force in 2011, actually, um, is called New Start. And like the other treaties before it, it really limits strategic arms 
between the US and Russia. Um, and it's an effort to try to slowly reduce the amount of nuclear weapons that both countries have because we have an obligation under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty from the 1970s, which said that countries that had nuclear weapons would reduce those weapons. Um, so this is a, a third in a series, and you can see the numbers up there. I won't go through all of them, but just suffice it to say, um, each one of these treaties that had been done starting back in the 80s, um, which was the first one signed by uh, George Bush uh, the first after Ronald Reagan had negotiated it, um, each one of these treaties have uh, gone forward in uh, limiting more and more and more the number of nuclear warheads that both countries have, the type of the number of ballistic missiles that we have. And so the idea is to continue to do these things. Um, the concern right now is that this treaty, which was entered into force in 2011, is about to expire. And in the treaty itself, it allows for both the US and Russia to extend it without having to go back to our, to our uh, Senate in the US side to get extension. So just on the agreement of the two parties, the US and Russia, this treaty can be extended and it can be replaced with a new treaty that will reduce the numbers even further. Um, the concern is that even though this has been a possibility for extending for many, for many months and obviously, you know, year or so, it has not happened. Um, and so we're running up until the February 2011 timeframe, I mean, 2021 timeframe, obviously. Now, recently in the past three weeks, there's been some back and forth with the U.S. and Russia to try to extend the treaty finally. A lot of this was obviously because the elections were coming up. The Trump administration wanted to have a win on their side uh, on, the, on the issue of New START. The problem was that it really was so late in the process that it was impossible really to get an agreement um, in a very fast, in a very quick time frame. So there was some back and forth about, you know, extending the treaty, maybe um, conditionally while the two sides discuss what the next treaty will look like. Um, but all of those failed. And another reason why this treaty failed is because the U.S. has been very insistent on getting China to be part of this bilateral agreement. This has run into problems because China does not want to be part of this group for a number of reasons. One of which is basically, it's been a bilateral treaty between the US and the Soviet Union and then Russia for many years. Um, and also China does not have nearly as many nuclear weapons as the US and Russia. So the US and Russia have up to you know, thousands and thousands of weapons. China has about, about 200, 300 weapons. So it doesn't feel like it needs to be part of an agreement for at this point at least. So that was a real stickler for the US kept saying that we wanted China and Russia was saying, we don't need China and we're not gonna go out and get China. And if you bring in China, then you should also bring in France and the UK, which was gonna be a no brainer So the situation as it is now is there are some last minute efforts to try to get this treaty extended. It hasn't worked. Um, and so right now we still have a time frame of February next year when this expires. One of the reasons why it's also important is because this is the last treaty between the US and Russia on these type of issues. Um, I'll go into in a second about the other treaty that we withdrew from during this administration. But if we lose this treaty, then what we lose is not only the last treaty between the US and Russia on nuclear weapons and missile issues, but we also lose out on all the verification that happens between the US and Russia as a result of this treaty. So because this treaty, we have verification, we have on-site inspections, we can go to Russia, for example, and see what they're doing. If we lose this treaty, all that's gone. Um, and so a forum for, for confidence building is also gone. In addition to that, um, the regular discussions that the two countries, the format that, that exists for the discussions will be gone as, as well. And at a time when we're having a lot of problems with Russia, you know, it's problematic to lose opportunities, as difficult as they may be, to lose opportunities to have these discussions with them. Um, so this is treaty, obviously, like I said, you know, stay tuned for this one to see what's gonna happen. But at this point, it will be expiring next year. Um, what I can say is that President-elect um, President Biden has made it, has, had, has said several times um, prior to his, prior to the election 
in November, uh, early this early this month that he would like to extend the treaty. Um, the other treaty that's of concern is the Intermediate Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, like the START Treaty, and I did I should have said the START Treaty is actually both countries have abided by the limitation, so that is all um, done. This is another treaty also started uh, in the 80s. Um, and it was signed by Reagan and Gorbachev, um, as many of you may recall and know of. Um, and it was limiting the intermediate range missiles uh, in Europe. This was a treaty that was very uh, obviously a favorite of our allies in Europe, since a lot of the ranges of these missiles that Russia, Soviet Union and Russia has will hit their territories if they were used. So this treaty um, is another one that was has been uh, successful. Over 2,692 missiles in the category of intermediate range have been destroyed. Um, and so it was very successful. The problem is that there started to be some allegation by the US um, back in 2014 that there were some, um, some violations by Russia in terms of what they were doing in terms of flight testing. And so there were discussions between uh, Russia and the US starting in the Obama administration about these alleged violations. Um, and so there was a lot of discussions back and forth. Of course, like I said, the, under the treaty, there's these forums in which you can have these discussions. Um, and of course, Russia came back saying that they were in compliance. The US is allegating that they were, were not in compliance. Suffice it to say, that the US decided to withdraw from the treaty um, under, the, under these, under the, um, under these uh, concerns about Russia, uh, saying that they were not complying. Um, and so another, the concern of course here is that um, some of our allies were obviously, would want the treaty to continue. And there were some in the arms control community who felt that we should have tried to continue to discuss this issue with the Russians rather than leaving. And once again, the problem is that it looks like the US is the one that is leaving the treaty. So while there's concern about Russia doing, Russia stays in, we have these discussions, the US withdraws. And then the problem is, in addition to that, is now you don't have a treaty in the region. So if Russia did want to do something, or if Russia or if the US wanted to, start doing more intermediate range missiles, there's nothing to prevent it because there is no treaty anymore. So this was another problem um, and the withdrawal was effective already last year. So this is another treaty that does not exist anymore. And so I can say that when the US withdrew from, from this treaty, there was concern about what the US was gonna do about New START and whether we were gonna actually stay within that treaty, which I just talked about. Um, all of you are aware about the JCPOA with Iran, the agreement with Iran uh, to stop their movement toward nuclear weapons. At the time that this was negotiated, Iran was about one year away from being able to develop a nuclear weapon. And if you recall, prior to that time frame before this agreement took place, there was a lot of back and forth between the US allies and Iran about what Iran was doing. So, you know, it was back and forth. We would say, our intelligence is saying you're trying to build a nuclear weapon. Iran would say, no, we're not. And this went back and forth and back and forth. And a concern was that while these discussions were taking place, that Iran was continuing to develop its programs so that it could actually test the nuclear weapon. And so we needed to stop that. We needed to stop that, that clock from happening. And so the main concern at that time, because that was the focus, was to have an agreement to stop Iran's nuclear weapon, nuclear weapons ambition. So to be clear, Iran does not have a nuclear weapon at this point. Um, and uh, now this, unlike some questions about like the INF treaty, there were no questions that Iran was abiding. As you may recall, this is a treaty that's between the US, Iran, China, France, Russia, UK, uh, Germany, and the European Union. And as a result of this treaty, Unlike before, we, it's agreement rather, we were able to get the IEA into, into Iran. 
And this is important because the IAEA, which is housed in Vienna, whose role is to help ensure states do not develop nuclear weapons, were able to get access to all of the facilities that we were alleging that Iran was using to develop a nuclear weapon. In fact, their access was more intrusive than any other country that the IAEA is actually um, able to, uh, does, does tests and evaluations to make sure a country's not developing nuclear weapons. Um, so as a result of the agreement, um, there was intelligence that we could have much better, not just satellites, we had people on the ground from the IAEA, and there were regular uh, checks by the IAEA verifying that Iran was not violating the treaty. Our, our US intelligence was saying they were not violating the treaty and our allied intelligence were all saying the same. So um, there was, and, and they had actually done quite a bit to reduce the amount of uranium, for example, that they could use to develop a weapon. Um, the problem is that the administration just never liked the agreement for various reasons. One, that it was associated with uh, President Obama, Two, that the administration just doesn't like Iran. And then there were some other issues that they were concerned about, for example, that it didn't cover ballistic missiles. And as I mentioned before, the issue at the time was to stop the clock so that Iran does not get any closer to developing a weapon. Because once a country has the weapon, it's a lot harder to get them to get rid of it, as we see with North Korea. So the idea was to make sure that they did not develop the weapon. So, Every time the president certified the treaty every 90 days, which he had to, um, he would always make a statement that he, you know, kind of, he did it grudgingly, you know, begrudging, he didn't really like it. Um, and so there was always this belief that he was going to withdraw. And he pretty much was saying that every time he certified it. Um, and once you, once he stopped certifying, of course, the sanctions can go back on. So the sanction had stopped when the agreement took place. Um, so we withdrew from the treaty after there were a lot of diplomatic uh, maneuvers uh, and discussions with France, the UK, Germany, coming to the US, talking to President Trump, asking him not to withdraw, um, but he withdrew, the US withdrew. France, Germany, Britain stayed in, so did China and Russia. Um, but needless to say, it's been very difficult to continue this agreement without the US, with all the sanctions that the US has put on Iran. Um, at this point, Iran still does not have a weapon. Um, and so um, that's pretty much where that is right now. Finally, um, we're going to go to North Korea. I think everyone, not, not a lot of details needed for this one. Um, everyone is aware of the back and forth that happened um, during with, with President Brunt, with President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Um, and we all know this is, this is an issue that has been around for a while. It's in, in previous administrations, North Korea uh, tested a nuclear weapon uh, three months after it withdrew from the non-proliferation treaty in 2003. And there have been, a, as you may recall, a series of attempts to try to um, talk to North Korea about their weapon, to get rid of their weapon. There were six party talks, as you might remember, that included China and Russia, uh, which, uh, which North Korea decided did not want to do anymore. Um, and, you know, there have been a number of discussions with them. Uh, we had an agreement in 1994 with them that didn't work out. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, uh, when President Trump came in and at first there was a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth that were really um, very angry words. Finally, there was the uh, decision to do the summit, which was in June of 2018. Um, in which you know there was a thinking that everything's going really well, nuclear threat is over. By President Trump, who stated that um, there was an idea for future meetings. Uh, the arms control community, I can say, was always very skeptical. We can talk about that later, but there was always a clear belief that this was not going to work because of the, the the time and effort to make something like this was never put in properly. Um, but everybody was hopeful, at least I think, because there, there was some dialogue uh, which had been missing. Um, and during that time frame, there were still demands that North Korea get rid of its nuclear weapons. North Korea wanted the U.S. to get rid of the sanctions. There's always been a disagreement about when that was going to happen, what the pace was. Um, and then there was another summit in February, uh, which ended early um, and was not successful. 
Um, of course, North Korea, again, wanted to end all the sanctions. North Korea uh, was upset because the U.S. would not get rid of all of the sanctions. and They're not going to get rid of the nuclear weapons until that happens. There's some other reasons uh, stated about why that didn't work. Suffice it to say, it was a failed summit. Um, then um, North Korea, then Trump went to North Korea and went across the DMV in June. It was another sign that maybe something good might happen. Um, unfortunately, uh, as you know, nothing just nothing really happened. North Korea had hoped that the U.S. would do something. There was a deadline by the end of 20, 2019 for the U.S. to come back to North Korea with some steps for uh, what they would do next to move the forward, move everything forward. That didn't happen. And so when the new year started this year, um, uh, Kim Jong-un said that his country was no longer bound by a self-imposed moratorium on nuclear missile testing um, and that it would unveil some new strategic weapons. So that's where that one is. Um, not in a good space, obviously. Uh, there was a lot of hope for a while but it really didn't lead to very much that was successful and we can talk about why. So that's really um, uh, well, all I'm gonna talk about. There's other things I can mention, but I, mean, I don't wanna take up more time. Um, and I do wanna allow time for questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Jenkins. I thought that was an outstanding, very clear presentation. And thank you for using the PowerPoint. I think that really helped us follow along. I wanted to just say again, interject one thing before I take the first question, and that's that we had the privilege two years ago for our annual conference here in Princeton of having Ambassador Wendy Sherman. And she, as you know, was the lead negotiator for the US in the Iran nuclear agreement. And she gave us a lot of detail on how much stick to and uh, uh, you know, really being flexible and really exploring all the angles. She had a large team, she said, that included nuclear experts, at least a thousand people she estimated were on her team. And so it was very impressive, but it also was a reminder to me of what hard sustained work it is to create peace agreements. They don't happen just by hoping for them or having a television summit or something. So again, uh, really thank you. And let me just add that to me, it also accentuates what research is showing more and more, which is that when women are at the negotiating table, we have a much higher chance of success of reaching peace agreements. So I just wanted to mention those few things uh, before we get to some questions here. And I think I'm going to start with Ed Aguilar, who's actually our Pennsylvania director, has been working on these issues for 40 or so years now. He says, Ambassador, uh, Madam Ambassador, thanks for a great presentation. As we enter the Biden administration, in addition to the treaties you reviewed, how does President-elect Biden get the U.S. reputation back? And how do we restore urgent action on climate and restore the UN and the WHO as important vehicles for international cooperation? Thanks, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be general in my comments because I'm I'm actually on the Biden transition team, so I can't I can't get into details about anything. Even though I think, quite frankly, when it comes to arms control and disarmament, um, you know, I think that. A lot of the calls are, have been out there for a while. So, but I, I guess what I will say is, um, you know, getting getting back to, you know, I think it's it's and just generally speaking. I think what we want to do is 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 make it very clear from the very beginning, um, you know, that the U.S. is is wants to once again play an important role in this field. I think in this area and in climate change, because it was asked, the question was asked. Um, you know, we have abdicated our role in terms of being a leader um, in many areas. And not that we were perfect in things. I mean, like I said, we have had nuclear weapons obviously for a long time. Um, so there's a lot of criticism about the US not disarming quicker um, and, you know, having all weapons and then wanting to modernize the weapons that we have. And, and then the Trump administration wanting to build new types of weapons, you know, these tactical nuclear weapons and putting them on different type of platforms. So certainly, um, you know, you know, so we, we, you know, we've done things that have not been obviously um, 
positive. Um, but I think we have to reassert our role. We have to reassert the idea that we are back and that we want to take a leadership role. And I think that's true in climate change as well. I think that you know we were we were a leader in the in the Paris uh, talks, uh, uh, and we've abdicated our role in many areas where we need to be when it turns to global when it turn, when we're talking about global threats, whether it's weapons of mass destruction or climate change or infectious disease issues. These are global challenges, and we should be taking a leadership role, and we haven't been. Uh, instead, we not only have stepped back from our role, but we've actually pivoted in a direction that's actually um, negative. So I think we need to at least make it very clear to the, the world that we want to take these things seriously and we want to take a leadership role. Particularly just adding on to climate change, I mean, the U.S. is one of the, if not the, or second worst in terms of, you know, greenhouse gases and the things that we're doing to the climate. So. As a, major, as a major contributor to climate change, we have a responsibility to take a role to try to see how we can mitigate. Thank you, Ambassador Jenkins. Our next question comes from Kathy Kip Cherry. Uh, she's on our board. She says, do you agree that the INF treaty put us at a significant disadvantage with China? Um, what I will say is that the I. There, and I, you know, I come from a obviously a long history of arms control. I started these issues in the early '90s, um, and you know, working on these treaties. Uh, the last decade of the night of real treaties, I say, is the '90s. We really did these long treaties. Um, I tend to not feel like we need to get out of treaties to find an answer. Um, for me, you know, and as you were saying, you know, these treaties are not easy to come to do. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of people, a lot of resources, and there's a lot of things that countries give up to, to find agreement. Um, and so if there's a problem, um, either you work through the treaty you have, through the mechanisms that these treaties provide, you know, and like I said, almost all of them have a review conference or a, a joint thing or joint this where you sit down and you talk about problems. Um, for me, you work, you, you work those problems out. So if we had an issue with China, if we're concerned about the missiles in China, um, before we get out of an agreement that's working in one part of the world, in Europe with our, with our allies who are happy with it, um, we should get into an agreement with China. We should let's say, okay, let's not destroy that because we want to have this. Let's keep that because that's working and you know, we don't want to start our arms race over here Let's keep that, and then let's also pivot and see what we can agree to with China. You know, that's the, that's how I would have probably done it. I don't think I would have tried to destroy uh, a treaty. And you know, this this ease of destroying treaties is is not comforting because you know, just to say again, you know, times change, and and trying to get back and do agreements again may not be as possible because the geopolitics have changed, interests have changed. Um, and, you know, so we, we, we may want to come back 10 years from now, 15, you know, 25 years and do something else like we did at INF, you know, and may not be able to because we may, things have changed. Since then. Thank you. I, the uh, next question I'll embellish just a little, which is the so-called nuclear modernization program that the U.S. has, and of course, Russia has its own as well. Uh, you know, does the, this has continued through the Obama and the uh, Trump administrations. Uh, is it in some ways undermining and almost contradicting our efforts to reduce nuclear weapons, to be pouring in our side to about $2 trillion is the latest estimate over the next 30 years. Does it, is, is there a problem with this in your mind? Yes, there is. Uh, there is for for the reasons that you've stated. One, uh, it's a lot of money, um, and you know we agreed to do that at the time at a time when it was already not necessarily a good idea financially. But now that we see COVID nineteen um, and the finance is going to take to fix that, and God only knows what what global threat will come after that, we have to look. We have to look at how we spend our money and how we invest in terms of our own security and our own protection. 
And it may require us to look at it differently so that we're not necessarily putting money in things that made sense many years ago, or we thought made sense many years ago. Um, and the money that we want to put in modernization is money that we won't be able to put in other things that we need to do. Um, and I think there's going to be a need to reevaluate that. Um, second of all, it does give it, it does give the opposite signal that we want to give in terms of the US being a role, playing a role, a leadership role in nonproliferation. And it does give the impression of us trying to strengthen our nuclear arsenal. Because um, if you're modernizing it, that means you're probably not going to want to reduce it. But so far, if you're going to modernize it, why would you put trillions of dollars to modernize something you're going to get rid of? Even though that's pretty much what we're doing with disarmament. <laughs> um, but it definitely goes away. It, it definitely goes opposite from uh, what we want to be saying and the message we want to put out. Thank you. I'm very heartened by that response. And I hope uh, that you have great influence with President-elect Biden to help him think the same way. <laughs> uh, and we certainly want to be supportive. I realize that it a lot of what it takes is grassroots pressure from the citizens of this country. And we have been working on that for a while and will continue to do so. Um, we have a question about unilateral disarmament. Oh, no, here, here's a good follow on question that just came in. How best can we slow down modernization? Do you think that the Biden administration would be willing to phase out ICBMs since our air and submarine nuclear capabilities are more than enough? And of course, the submarines are invulnerable too, as you know. And this would free up funds for other uses. Um. Honestly, I'm not sure if, if uh, I mean, I, obviously I can't say if I, if I knew <laughs> what, what, what the administration would do. But what I will, what, what I will say is that um, part of what we need to be thinking about, and I think this is one of the calls that several organizations are making increasingly, and I think particularly now with COVID-19, is um, looking at the different platforms that we have for nuclear, of uh, our nuclear force structure um, and making decisions, hard decisions, decisions that I think we took for granted, making hard decisions about um, what, we're, what, what we need to spend our money on to be secure uh, in the nuclear space. Um, and so that will certainly call into question, call into question, um, Forces that I think, like I said, we just normally would go ahead and put money on um, because we just assumed that it was what we need. But I think it's a time to really, and this goes back to the first question, it really is an opportunity to reassess, reassess what we're doing in terms of our money. And going back to your, your recent question about the modernization, this, this all is part of the same question of, and it's been, it's not only because of disarmament and nuclear weapons issues and the fact that the U.S. is increasingly going to get its back up against the wall by countries who don't have nuclear weapons are saying you have to do better, uh, particularly with the new treaty that was going to be that's going to enter into force in January uh, on nuclear weapons, prohibition nuclear weapons. Um, that's going to make uh, that's going to make nuclear weapons illegal. Um, you know, this is a time to really reassess these questions, look at these things, and in terms of the trillions of dollars modernization. Um, the type of platforms that we have and what's really, use, what's really useful at this point. Thank you. Another question along the same lines is about the positive alternative. As you probably know, the 50 country recently ratified the nuclear ban treaty. And so in, in 90 days, basically early next year, it'll be going into force, become a part of international law. No nuclear nations have signed it, including the United States. But do you, we've been supporting this, by the way. In fact, the scientific advisor is a scientist here at Princeton, uh, Dr. Zia Mian, who we honored at our last membership dinner. Uh, do you think this is an important uh, step? And is it something that could help us move in a more positive direction? Yeah, I think it is, a, I think it is an important step and, and yes, you're right. I mean, none of the nuclear, none of the declared nuclear weapon states, none of the states that have nuclear weapons um, attended the negotiations, uh, haven't signed it. Um, so we know that they're, you know, that the countries that have the nuclear weapons are not a part of it. 
Um, and that is, a, that is an issue. However, um, I think it's important because of Article 6 of the NPT that you know, all countries are supposed to you know, have a discussion about nuclear weapons and, and the negotiation about disarmament. Um, it does, in fact, um, for a number, for all the countries that have a part of it, it, for them, it's implementing that provision, even though other countries are not. Um, and if nothing else, it does strengthen the norm against nuclear weapons use and possession, and it also makes it illegal. So in this sense, um, it does raise uh, the importance of the, the efforts to prohibit nuclear weapons uh, by just its very existence and the fact that there'll probably be more countries who will sign up. Um, there will be a need to, I think, I mean, obviously it's not done yet. There still needs to be some discussions with nuclear weapon states. Um, there will be an opportunity at the MPT review conference to continue these discussions and find a way to maybe see if there's a step forward. Thank you. Another question, and this is actually from uh, the representative of one of our co-sponsors, Lawrenceville Presbyterian Church, not far from here in Princeton. How do we counter the strong and growing nationalism and anti-globalization, which impedes our involvement in these very important global problems? Um, I think we need to look and see just how much that um, it is anti-global right now. I think that because of the recent administration of this administration, I think those who are anti-global and who um, who don't see the importance of a global of, of, of the U.S. being part of a global community have the platform. But I also think that we'll see how much that stays the case. And I think that uh, there the next generation is much more global minded. And as they, as, they, um, as they become the leaders, um, this can hopefully make, it, make a more permanent shift, hopefully. So I think those, 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 uh, those attitudes will remain, they'll be out there. Whether they are the dominant is yet to be seen. So. Thank you. Uh, one more question. This is from the representative of Grace United Church of Christ in Flemington, another one of the co-sponsors. Uh, what are the main arguments against getting rid of all nuclear weapons in the world and what would have to be done to carry this out? Um, I think the main argument, obviously by those who have nuclear weapons is um, deterrence. You know, if, I, if, if, this, if this country has it, then I need it to deter that particular country. Um, security. Um, some countries believe they, it, it gives them more security to have it. Um, I think different country, prestige, you know, you know, I think, you know, people don't talk about France and the UK because their numbers are much lower than the US and Russia. But I think France is very tied to their nuclear weapons because it gives them some prestige. Just, you know, so, I mean, so it's not just the US and Russia, it's the smaller countries that have them. And like I said, you know, India, Pakistan, that's a security issue uh, in a, in a feeling as if, I mean, when India tested, Pakistan was going to test. There was very little we could do to stop it. We tried, but they, they tested a few days later because they were not going to feel as if they're not secure in that region. So, you know, uh, status, you know, status and prestige, um, security, you know, these are some of the reasons why they, they uh, countries have it. Um, how do we change that? Well, we have to try to change the, those, those perceptions which are not always easy, but that's where things like the TPNW play a role because you try to change the norm, you try to change the perception of, of the importance of it. Um, and if nothing else, you can try to prevent other states from not developing weapons. So it's not nine that, you know, you, you can keep it at nine countries that have weapons and not have more weapons. And then, then the effort is try to convince these countries to get rid of it. So you need start treaties, you need the new start, you need another, another treaty to keep the big, the two powers to keep going down, you know, as, as that's, that's fundamentally important because the other countries are not gonna feel like they need to do anything while their numbers are so much lower. Thank you. And I think I'll make this the last question before just a closing comment briefly from myself. And uh, it's after this week, do you think our allies are sleeping better at night? Um, I would say yes. 
Um, and as a diplomat, there may not be a diplomatic answer, but I think so. I think, I, and I think probably a lot, I would, I would say that many of them were wondering, is this a blip or is this for real? And I think, you know, the results of the elections are there, you know, a lot of, obviously there's a lot of Americans that still are very much in the uh, President Trump camp. So we see that, that that's the case. But I think in terms of the leader of the United States and um, the position that, you know, a new direction can happen, I think is probably welcome for a lot, for at least for our close allies, for sure. Um, and I think that they, like I said, I think they were just not sure. This is, many of us, were, many people were not sure what was going on um, and still probably are unsure about what was going on. Um, and they certainly were. So I know, I know with many friends overseas, they were watching our election just as close to me. So. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. That was, I think, another outstanding presentation and let's show our appreciation so much. That was absolutely you, wonderful. And we thank you, wish by the way, you thank, the... you for, thank you for everything you're doing and for everything uh, everyone on this, in, on this Zoom is doing on these issues. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And we certainly wish you the very best in terms of uh, your participation in the Biden transition team. Uh, we're ready for new opportunities to emerge, to get on back on a more peaceful track, and hopefully to move our world toward this vision of the global abolition of nuclear weapons, which uh, is something, as, as Major Sherson said in his remarks, they're the two existential threats to all of humanity, of course, our nuclear weapons, which would still destroy all of humanity, and the climate crisis, which is already getting worse, way worse than anybody expected. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got a lot of work to do. We hope that you, our viewers, thank you very much again for being with us. Uh, we hope that you will stay with us because this has to be a team effort. There's no Lone Rangers here. Uh, it has to be a team effort. And we need your ongoing support. Uh, we, have on, we have committee meetings. We have a com committee for political action, our advocacy committee meeting uh, coming up in November. We'll take a holiday then in December, uh, but we really hope you'll stay with us. Uh, if you didn't make a donation yet, some of you did as you registered for this, we'd certainly welcome uh, your financial support at peacecoalition.org on the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but there's many other ways. There's a volunteer tab. You can get involved with us. Uh, we really appreciate all that you do because there's no Lone Rangers. That's one thing I've learned in now 42 years of doing this work full time. There's no Lone Rangers in this work. It's always a team effort. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Wendy Sherman made that point very strongly when she spoke for us two years ago, that the success Unfortunately, it was undermined, but hopefully we'll be able to get back into the Iran nuclear agreement now. But the success of that agreement was because of the very strong team that she coordinated and led. So again, we're very grateful to everybody for being on this and especially to our two superb speakers. I thought the presentation by each of you was really, really superb. We are ending and boy, do we run a tight ship. We said we would end at three o'clock and it's happening. Do you believe in miracles now? <laughs> Everybody, thanks and have a great rest of your day and a good weekend. Hope we'll be hearing from all of you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.